Hey everyone, uh, we're looking to hire a part-time communications manager to join the Epicenter team. You can get more information about that position at epicenter.tv slash apply. So if you're interested in learning more about that, if you have, think you have what it takes, go to that website uh, and uh, you'll find the job description and uh, the instructions on how to apply for our communications manager position. Thanks. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Alex Wern. Alex Wern is the CEO of Decentralized Capital, and uh, he has a long experience of working with software, at IBM, software management, did an MBA, and then he started, well, he joined this company called Decentralized Capital. So uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Alex. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. Yeah, so this is a topic that we've talked about a, a few times in different ways. This is a sort of topic of having a, a fiat currencies on a blockchain, stable assets on a blockchain. And what, and so um, I look forward to kind of revisiting that, especially in the context of, uh, of Ethereum. And uh, also what was interesting about uh, decentralized capital is that their Ethereum startup that's very focused on, on being compliant and doing like KYC and uh, you know compliance with regulation which is something that's kind of a new thing. I don't think we've seen that in any of the other uh, Ethereum projects that we have on. So um, yeah, we look forward to talking about all of that. But maybe to get started, Alex, do you mind sharing how you got interested and involved in uh, blockchain and Ethereum in the first place? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess it started in around 2011, 2012, like many people saw this thing called Bitcoin uh, come out and was just, just immediately curious. Um, as an economist, I was a little skeptical of the idea of a, of a currency that isn't necessarily backed by a, a government or, you know, doesn't have kind of a, a guaranteed redemption, you know, an entity kind of issuing and, and backing it. Um, but certainly you, you can't argue that the, the technology is fascinating, the ability to, you know, to create this distributed ledger that everyone can agree upon the balances without, you know, having a central authority to manage it. Um, so in terms of kind of the genesis of decentralized capital, I actually have my brother, Phil, to, to thank for that. So he was even more involved in, in the community early on. It was actually a co-founder of EtherX, which was one of the very early Ethereum projects uh, working on a decentralized exchange. Um, so he was working on that for a little over a year. And during that time, I uh, kind of realized that for a decentralized exchange to, to be successful, you really need a way to represent fiat currency in that environment. Um, you know, if you want to create the most liquid pairs that exist on centralized exchanges, uh, you really need to be able to represent dollars, euros, yuan, etc. Um, and then when looking at kind of the different options for doing so, uh, we chose the, the route where it's collateralized by a bank deposit. Um, so, you know, there's other kind of pr approaches to this, this stablecoin problem. Uh, and decentralized capital has taken the approach where we accept deposits from customers, uh, hold them in a bank account, and then issue back a token that, that represents them uh, that can be traded anywhere on the Ethereum blockchain. So the core problem uh, you're trying to solve really is that people want to use uh, blockchain applications, Ethereum applications, but they don't want to be tied to a volatile currency. Exactly. Yeah. So the real focus, I think, you know, kind of mentioned the idea of, of exchanges and decentralized exchanges and creating that, that crypto fiat pair. Um, it's not possible unless you have a token that actually represents fiat that's on the blockchain, uh, just because it can't interact with a regular bank account. Right. Um, but then if you kind of take that use case and expand it further, then it's really well suited for all sorts of Ethereum applications, in particular ones where there's a smart contract that's holding assets for an extended period of time. Uh, so the example that I like to talk to a lot is the idea of a prediction market. Um, so there's currently some prediction markets that are live that are focused on the outcome of the U.S. presidential election. Uh, and some of these have been live for months now. And the, the wagers are currently denominated in Ether. 
And you've basically, if you purchase one of these prediction tokens, you've basically entered into two speculations. Uh, one, the outcome of the presidential election. Uh, the other being the price of Ether when this event resolves. Um, and as you've, you've seen, you know, certainly uh, the, the recent price has been relatively stable. Um, but if you happen to have purchased that asset, you know, the night before the Dow event, then you would have lost 50% of its value. And it had nothing to do with the actual event that you were speculating on. You know, the, the election itself may have not changed at all, but the value of your, your prediction token has changed dramatically. Um, so just thinking through that, you know, there's, that's a, a good use case for, for our assets, where if you have a, a token that represents dollars or euros, whatever kind of your local traditional currency is, is uh, then you can engage in that prediction market without simultaneously speculating on the price of the particular cryptocurrency that you're using. Interesting. And yeah, that, that's definitely uh, one, uh, one big uh, issue with prediction markets is that you know, you're, as you mentioned, you're, you're betting against two speculative uh, sort of events. Um, and that's one of the hurdles, I guess, to making decentralized prediction markets enter sort of commonplace amongst uh, speculators. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about the architecture of decentralized capital. Uh, we've had a few projects on before, uh, I, I guess there's one that kind of comes to mind, um, which uh, tried to tackle this uh, problem of pegging a cryptocurrency to a uh, fiat currency, and uh, that was a new coin. And um, I haven't followed that project very closely, but I think right after we had them on, that whole system sort of fell apart and the peg was no longer maintained. Well, let's let's talk about then the architecture uh, and how perhaps it's different from other uh, markets uh, or sorry other uh, stable coins uh, that are based on this uh, coin and share um, uh, combination. Sure. So you can essentially there's kind of two sides to to the business that we have. Uh, one is the Ethereum token side where we are creating and minting these assets that represent different government currencies. Uh, so we have DUSD, DEUR, etc. Uh, that are tokens that can be freely traded on the Ethereum blockchain that represent the, the corresponding uh, government currency. Um, and then the question that it kind of raises is how do we know that these tokens have value? Um, in this case, we've taken, I, I guess, a bit of a more conceptually simple approach uh, where the assets, the, the tokens are actually backed and collateralized by deposits in a traditional bank account. Uh, so we've partnered or we're working with a financial institution, crypt, Crypto Capital, uh, that allows us to, to interface with and um, store customer funds at large multinational banks. Uh, so kind of the way it works is a customer who wants to get, gain some of our assets to purchase some of our assets would send us funds either via a wire transfer to crypto capital uh, or purchase via Bitcoin. Um, once we've received that, in the case of Bitcoin, it's actually immediately sold on the open market uh, into the currency that the customer is purchasing. Um, so if you wanted to buy 100 DUSD, you would send us, I don't know the, the price today, but you know approximately 0.18 or something like that Bitcoin. Uh, which would immediately be sold on the open market and turned into a $100 deposit that would be held at uh, by Crypto Capital at one of their banking partners. Uh, we then issue the corresponding asset, the DUSD, back to the customer. Uh, they're then free to use that uh, at any of the Ethereum applications that's coded to accept them. Um, and in most cases, that means any Ethereum application. So our tokens comply with what's known as the ERC-20 token standard, which is something that's been adopted by the community to ensure that these different applications and all of these different assets on the network uh, are kind of interoperable. Um, so some of the applications currently support them as default tokens. Uh, and if it's not a default token, most applications have made it so that users can add them themselves just by using the contract address uh, the, the the symbol as well as the precision of the token, how many decimal places it has. So a few questions here, uh, and you know, we'll, I guess we'll dissect this architecture uh, and the different components and partners involved. Uh, the first one is uh, you you described uh, this company Crypto Capital, uh, and so essentially from our discussions earlier, they provide a solution uh, through which um, exchanges and companies 
working in the cryptocurrency space can basically just plug into their existing relationships with banks and allow for uh, that interface with the traditional financial system. So if you're an exchange, for instance, you you, know, you 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 subscribe to Crypto Capital Service, and they offer sort of a white label solution that would allow that exchange to very easily accept um, fiat funds, and they will handle so the exchange between uh, the the exchange on uh, on the open markets. On on that side, uh, and given the fact that your company is called Decentralized Capital, at first glance, it's, it seems a bit mis- a bit misleading to say decentralized capital when in fact those funds uh, and uh, the fiat funds uh, and the issuance of those funds are done by uh, a centralized entity. Can you expand on that? Sure. So, I mean, the, the naming was just coincidental. We didn't mean to, to cause any confusion with decentralized capital and, and crypto capital. Um, but basically, yeah, as you described, they provide services to existing large exchanges such as Kraken, uh, Bitfinex, um, that do exactly what you just articulated. Uh, they help them bring in fiat currency into their ecosystem. Um, so they help us with our KYC AML process. And then they also have the relationship with the banks um, that then store the funds of our customers. Uh, and we've been very transparent about this since day one. Um, you know, We're a software service provider uh, to crypto capital customers and the assets that they hold. Um, so we are experts at the Ethereum architecture, you know, creating these assets in such a way that they can be securely transferred on the Ethereum network. Um, and then they are experts in finance. So they actually came out of, it was a, a group of former bankers of, of well, I guess, currently still bankers, but they were receiving a lot of applications from different crypto companies and realized that there was kind of an opportunity for a business model here where they could be the ones that hold the relationships with the banks um, and do the screening on the on kind of the crypto company side and then help provide those services where, where needed, really that fiat integration that you mentioned. And so how, then how does one know, well, like what's the trust model here? How does one know that those fiat reserves uh, actually exist at Crypto Capital? Sure, yeah. So we've instituted a proof of reserves process on our website. Um, such that anyone, there's actually a page on our, on our site, decentralizedcapital.com slash reserves, um, where anyone can go and see in real time both the amount of assets on the blockchain. Uh, so we link to the Block Explorer Etherscan. Uh, we link to our contract there. So anyone can see the number of assets in existence, um, as well as the transactions that have occurred. Uh, and then there's also a link to a site, or excuse me, to a page on Crypto Capital's website that represents the API call uh, for our account balances um, so that you can see kind of in real time that, you know, our dollars, our euros are fully backed uh, in terms of, you know, what we've issued and, and are currently floating around on the Ethereum blockchain. Crypto Capital itself is a, a licensed uh, and you know, regulated entity, um, and we've also published or are currently working to publish the report. Uh, it's generated monthly that shows that they're in good standing, that they kind of have the funds um, that they claim to have on their accounting and financial statements. But so diving into this a little bit, uh, if you guys publish uh, a API response, I, I presume, I mean, that's not something I can verify that uh, that it actually, you know, you actually got this response, right? It's just some text you put on a website. Or is there any way for me to verify that? It's actually, sorry if I misspoke, it's a URL on Crypto Capital's website. So we actually don't have any control or, or impact on, on the server that's offering this information. Um, so granted, you know, you are trusting that Crypto Capital is being honest in the information that they're providing. And that's where we, we try to take that level of transparency one, one deeper and provide kind of the reports and information that shows that Crypto Capital is in good standing with the regulators that are responsible for making sure that you know, they're operating in compliance with the financial regulations that apply to them. But do you think that model is scalable? Because because right now you guys are sort of launching and and you say like okay you know that that's that's good that's fine, uh, but you know presume you know assuming that Ethereum is gonna actually become very successful, a lot of people start using that, having you know millions, tens of millions, what we've seen with uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, you know held by a single entity like Crypto Capital, that seems to go you know, not so well together with the whole trust model that's really at the heart of of cryptocurrencies. So did you think there's going to be better ways of managing that in the future? 
Sure. So crypto capital does have relationships with multiple different banks. So there is kind of a diffusion of the risk, if you will, on their side, where they're actually not holding it with any one financial partner. Um, they're held, you know, they have accounts at different large firms. Uh, so that kind of helps separate out some of the risk of, of default for those firms themselves. Um, additionally, we are also working to get other financial uh, providers that would be forming performing a similar function as crypto capital, um, recognizing that, you know, we'd like to kind of diffuse that risk on our side as well uh, by bringing on board as many entities who are interested in being kind of the custodians of these funds um, that are backing up the assets that we're issuing on the blockchain. Um, and, you know, we acknowledge that it's not going to be for everyone. Uh, you know, if your goal is true decentralization and not reliance on some some third party that you have to trust, then, you know, we are not the, the stablecoin solution. And that's where people are looking at things, you know, they're trying things, for example, new, new bits. Um, and, you know, we do think that, you know, potentially some of those problems can be solved. Uh, but today, a lot of them are relying on kind of this over collateralization model, you know, locking up three times the collateral of a cryptocurrency in order to issue, you know, some sort of stable asset, you know, so if you want $10 of, of USD, you have to lock up $30 worth of Ether. Um, and we think that's just a very uh, poor allocation of, of capital in that case. And that if you're, you know, willing to put your trust into, you know, these large banks that have been around for a while and have, uh, you know, kind of these financial insurance systems, you know, these, these systems that are meant to insure and uh, kind of make depositors whole in the event of any issue, um, then this is a, a better solution uh, for providing that, that stable asset in the Ethereum network. No, I, I definitely agree. Like, I mean, uh, what I was talking, what I, what I was touching about earlier with the decentralized aspect uh, doesn't necessarily uh, mean that I, I don't think that this is a, an interesting model and that it it has the potential to very sort of easily allow people to onboard uh, into Ethereum. Uh, simply, I think that it's probably one of the things that you get a lot of, you may if not already get a lot of criticism for from some of the some part of the of the crypto community uh, for not being completely decentralized. But uh, I guess, as you said, uh, this is something that is up to everyone uh, to decide whether or not they want to be, you know, use this type of service or something that's completely decentralized. I think for a lot of people that are interested in uh, getting you know, into uh, you know, using dApps, that kind of thing, this can be a, a great solution. Um, now, coming back to the issuing uh, component, you know, putting aside um, crypto capital, but coming back to you know, your business and decentralized capital, can you talk about how those assets are issued? Yeah, so we've got kind of a multi-part contract system that serves as a kind of a system of checks and balances that helps ensure that there isn't much risk from our perspective in terms of the fact that we have the ability to, from a central central place, you know, from, from ourselves, be able to kind of issue and send out these assets to customers. Um, so really, there's kind of uh, four different key contract pieces. So there's the the name reg contract, which basically points uh, people. It, it's a consistent contract address uh, that people can use to interact with our assets and points to the, the back end contracts, as we call them, which allows us to do updates to functionality without having individuals have to migrate or kind of move and, and know a new Ethereum address. Um, additionally, we've got the back end contract that's got a couple different pieces. So there's the minting piece. Um, so this is, and, and I should first add that all of these contracts and all of this functionality is controlled via a multi-signature approach. Uh, so no one individual in the company has the ability to issue or generate these commands. Uh, you know, we are in separate locations uh, and these keys are all stored offline uh, on USB such that when we issue these commands, uh, we actually send them to a separate Ethereum node that's online to have them broadcast to the network. Uh, so that's one way that we kind of diffuse the risk of this, this approach of generating assets. Um, additionally, we have kind of the control, the powers, if you will, separated into different key sets, uh, different key stores. Um, so one of them are the minting contracts or the minting keys, which allow us to issue and create new new assets. Uh, so in that example earlier, if you want to buy 100 DUSD, we would use our minting keys to actually bring that DUSD into existence. Uh, and it's only done after we've received the deposit from the customer in order to ensure that the assets on the blockchain are always less than the amount that we have in reserves. Um, once generated, they actually are deposited only into one wallet, which we term the hot wallet. Uh, the hot wallet then has a separate set of keys that we use to then send the assets out to the customer. Uh, however, that can only be done after a third set of keys approves the amount to be transferred from the hot wallet. 
uh, those keys are kind of looking at the crypto capital API as well as our website uh, to understand you know was this deposit real um, you know was this should we actually approve this amount of assets to be sent to the customer um, so you can see that kind of you know we have these different layers of control such that you know, we don't expect anything to happen because, like I said, we're, we're storing the keys offline and, and signing transactions offline. But should any of that to be compromised, we've got these different gates, if you will, uh, that kind of ensure that, you know, that there's the, the damage that, you know, these assets wouldn't actually be out released out into the wild. Because, of course, the, the kind of nightmare scenario here would be that somebody hacks you guys and then issues, you know, a million DUSD where while there's only fiat reserves for a thousand. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we've kind of explored a couple different approaches to this, right? We've also got, um, the, I mentioned that idea of, of an oversight system that approves the amount that's being sent out from the hot wallet. Uh, we've also thought of a system that could essentially, you know, hold a key. And if it sees, uh, you know, a certain amount being created, that's just out of the ordinary, you know, it locks everything down just while we have an opportunity to investigate. Um, you know, so that could be used to, you know, we're, we'll probably touch on this a little later, but, you know, we're performing kind of analytics on where our assets are being used and, and kind of where we see them moving on the blockchain. And that's something else that we could have, you know, kind of a machine learning approach if it sees something that's out of the ordinary and indicative of a security issue, uh, it could actually lock down the network while we have an opportunity to investigate. Um, so, you know, we're open to suggestions from, from others in the community, but uh, this is kind of the system that we've, we've architected. Um, and I should mention that our contracts are open sourced and are available on GitHub uh, if anyone else wants to take a look and see kind of the approach that we've taken to security here. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now, in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. One of the interesting things about uh, about that aspect too, like how you're managing security is that you have the ability to freeze assets and to confiscate assets, which uh, which probably ticks off a lot of people when they hear that, right? Sort of blockchain and the ability to freeze and confiscate assets. Uh, so can you explain, first of all, how does this work technically and what's the thinking behind this? Sure, so technically um, we have different sets of keys that can issue commands that freeze the assets um, from, from moving anywhere on the network. Uh, and can that, that can be either a specific target where we target a specific wallet, a uh, specific address that's holding our assets. It can also be a network-wide freeze. Um, and then on top of that, once the assets are frozen, we have the ability to take back those assets and bring them back into our possession. Uh, and really the reason that we have that is, is a legal and regulatory one. Um, there's just certain things that, you know, we could not allow our assets to be used for, uh, given that, you know, we are integrated with a traditional banking system and these assets represent, they're kind of like a bearer asset on these underlying deposits. Um, so for example, if our assets were popping up on, you know, the, the often used uh, example of an assassination market, um, or some other sort of dark net market. Uh, we can't just turn a blind eye to, to law enforcement if they come to us and say, hey, we need your help tracking down these individuals. Uh, we need your help, you know, getting your funds back from back from these criminals. Um, there's a full list of use cases on our website that are prohibited. Um, but in general, it's just, you know, don't don't break the law. If it's it, it's pretty extreme things, you know, bribery, corruption, uh, you know, extortion, uh, tra drug trafficking, all that sort of stuff. Um, and basically our, our goal there is, you know, we're, we're not going to use these uh, unless it's it's kind of, you know, legally necessary. You know, we're certainly not trying to prevent users from, 
from using our assets, and it's and it's not in our best interest to do so, right? Um, so this is only in the event that it's that it's truly necessary, and it's kind of uh, like I said, it's it's a requirement so that we can uh, operate legally and 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 within the confines of all the existing regulation. So are you taking then a sort of proactive approach by whitelisting services that your act, your assets can integrate with? Or is this uh, uh, an approach where you would address issues, you know, and, and freeze accounts if, you know, someone were to report uh, your assets being used on, say, the fashion nation market, as you mentioned? Yeah, so at the moment, our assets can move anywhere to any address. So we're taking the the blacklist approach, as you mentioned. Um, so I, I talked a little earlier, you know, we we're building an internal analytics tool that will allow us to see, you know, different contracts, different places that our assets are moving. So pretty quickly, we'll get an understanding of what these different applications are, if they're getting any sort of sort of volume with our assets. Uh, anything such as like a dark net market, you know, if that pops up on Ethereum, we're going to blacklist that immediately just because that's something that we can't support and we have no interest in supporting. Um, and the expectation is that, you know, if you're a customer trying to use something on that, that site, there are plenty of truly decentralized currencies that, you know, that you can use in that case. Um, so we expect that, uh, you know, this, this ability to enforce these rules will also help to act as a deterrent um, just because, if we, you know, it's a, it's a risk that if, uh, you know, if we catch someone doing this, you know, we will absolutely freeze and, and confiscate those assets if they're being used for illegal purposes. That, that puts you in a really delicate position, I imagine, because for one, um, you know, if you look at darknet markets, uh, for instance, in certain places, it's very legal and possible to say buy magic mushrooms on the internet. Uh, in others, uh, it wouldn't be. Uh, or, you know, if we talk about things like um, donations to certain political parties, uh, some places might see that as a problem, others may not. Where, how, how are you going to arbitrate that kind of uh, you know, very delicate decision on whether or not uh, assets should be frozen or not? Yeah, so we admit that this is kind of a, a learning process, right? This is something that uh, you know, it's kind of unprecedented in that we're, we're figuring out as we go. Um, for something like a dark net market, if it pops up, it's going to be blacklisted. Um, you know, we understand that there could be purchases on there that are legal in some specific jurisdiction. Uh, but basically, you know, we have to follow the laws of the UK where we are incorporated. Um, and in that case, you know, most, most things being most transactions on a dark net market, you know, we are unable to support. Um, and so the easiest approach is for us to just, just blacklist those altogether. Um, the goal being that, you know, we think the majority of Ethereum uh, kind of commerce is going to be perfect, perfectly legitimate, perfectly legal businesses uh, where people want an alternative to something like Ether, where they want access to the currency that they use in their everyday life. And really, that's the business that we're focused on, right, is, is being that payment processor, that representation of fiat on the Ethereum blockchain for all the awesome, amazing, you know, legal apps and applications that are that are coming up. What about a P2P transfer? Are you also restricting those in some ways? Uh, or, or are you, for example, restricting the amount that a person can get of, of a certain asset? Yeah, so we're, um, we, we're going to institute kind of low level uh, KYC requirements for purchasing the assets, which, uh, you know, if you are not verified, kind of limits the amount that you can purchase at any one time. Um, in terms of transactions, once they're issued and on the network, uh, there's actually been some precedents from FinCEN in terms of guidance that once the assets are created, they can move freely to third parties without having to do additional KYC AML. Um, so in that case, you know, once we, we know who the customer is, who's buying the assets, uh, we issue them to them and then they're freely tradable on the Ethereum network, you know, to any other peer, any other wallet. Um, we acknowledge that if we're successful, that could, that could potentially change just because our assets are designed to represent legal tender. Um, and if it gets to some point where our assets are, you know, something that can be used to, to make a lot of real world purchases, it's certainly possible that we now have uh, more regulation that's required in terms of understanding where our assets are moving. Um, but kind of the precedent so far has been that the regulators want to know when money is moving in and out of the system, uh, but that the movement of the virtual currency itself can be done without knowing who the individual is. So similar to how, you know, a Bitcoin wallet provider isn't subject, doesn't have to do KYC AML on their customer. Um, and if you think about what they're trying to prevent in terms of money laundering, it, it makes sense. You know, their goal is to prevent people from 
getting you know ill-gotten cash cash from criminal activity into the the traditional banking system so that it can be used to purchase you know houses cars education fund traditional assets um, and so far virtual currencies haven't really gained that level of adoption such that they can be used to make those those purchases um, so instead they've taken which i think is a pretty prudent approach of regulating the the entry and exit points really those those gateways uh, where you're converting from fiat currency into crypto or crypto back into fiat okay very interesting so We've been doing this podcast for quite a while now, and it reminds me a lot, listening to you speak, to a lot of the conversations that we had, you know, two years ago, where Bitcoin payment processors were grappling with a lot of the same issues. And I think for Ethereum, this is a, a new thing. So I'm curious, what have your conversations been like? Have you spoken with a lot of regulators? Is this a topic that comes up a lot? And, and what's the response been? Yeah, absolutely. So I think... Um you know, I mentioned earlier our decision to incorporate in the UK. A lot of that came from their approach to regulating this this activity. Uh, I think no regulator wants to be the guy that killed innovation in blockchain in their country, right? The guy that said the internet will never amount to anything and is, you know, looking back later on and realizing that he made, you know, he or she made a mistake. Um, so a lot of them are taking uh, what is very uh, kind of a prudent approach of, you know, kind of do no harm, but make sure that they can still operate within the existing legal and regulatory structure that has been created for all of the other products and services that exist today. Um, so that's really been a lot of what the UK focus has been, and their their approach can kind of boil down simply to do do KYC AML on your customers. Um, you know when you're when they're getting money in and out of the system, uh, and uh, you know and you'll be fine. And uh, I think that's kind of a, a prudent approach, right? They don't want to kill the innovation, and they're kind of uh, letting it grow and, and kind of see you know see where it see where it all goes. Um, certainly we expect that if this ecosystem develops like we hope it to, that regulatory approaches may change. Um, like I said, we're currently, our, our DC assets are currently considered a virtual currency, uh, but it's very possible that because they represent a claim on cash deposits on legal tender, that should we be very successful, um, they actually get reclassified themselves because they essentially become fungible for the cash in your pocket. Um, but we think if that happens, that's a that's a great problem for us to have because it means we've been <laughs> enormously successful. So you also mentioned the the monitoring transaction thing uh, in Bitcoin as well. We've done some episodes about that. For example, we had Chainalysis on once that that's doing that kind of thing. Are, are those companies already offering this for Ethereum? Is this something that uh, is coming up? Or you mentioned you were doing some of that stuff internally. What's what's the status with that? Yeah, so that's something we are pretty much just just starting to explore. So um, there's some block explorers out there, Etherscan. Uh, there was actually one that was just released yesterday. I think it's like, uh, I forget the name of it, but it just popped up yesterday. That's trying to give some more sophisticated uh, kind of offerings in terms of you know, monitoring blockchain transactions and really taking it the next level and using it to gain insights. Um, in our case, we'll be interested in you know, where are our assets moving? Who are the large customers? Uh, what are the large applications? You know, the, the largest use cases um, that will help us one kind of tailor our product. You know, we can figure out where are these where are these uh, assets really popular? Are there other services or things that we can be providing that will make them more useful to our customers? Uh, and two, just help us from you know potentially from a regulatory perspective, make sure that we're you know in compliance in terms of where the assets are being used um, and where they're moving about to ensure that we're complying with all existing laws. Are you guys also thinking of uh, developing some front end, some uh, wallet type things for for managing this? We've we've thought about it. It's further down our product product roadmap just because there's some great tools already out there, and they all interact or comply with the Ethereum token standard, uh, which means that individuals who purchase our assets can easily add them to those wallets and manage them through those existing infrastructures. Um, so when I gave my, my presentation at Demo Day, I actually used my Ether wallet as an example. So we had the my Ether wallet interface up showing a balance of zero DUSD, went over to our website to make a purchase, and then came back you know a minute later and the balance had updated to show that the assets had been sent. Um, so it's something that's that's kind of on our radar, but at the moment we don't think it's a high priority given that there's a lot of other products in the ecosystem tackling that issue. 
Um, and really, that's a large part of why, you know, we're on Ethereum is this whole piece, this whole idea of, you know, integration and, and synergy, where the more applications, the more products that, that pop up on the network, the more valuable our product becomes. You know, the more places they can be used, uh, the more valuable it is that we're providing this stable asset for the ecosystem. Today's magic word is capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim you're a part of the listener reward. So what has the reception been? Uh, you mentioned that you uh, you showed off uh, uh, at uh, a demo day. What, what, have, what have you had uh, so far as far as reception from the community? Yeah, so far it's been awesome. Um, I think there were some comments from some of the judges, Vitalik included, just pointing out that this is a core functionality that other applications and, and other pieces of the ecosystem can really build and rely upon. Um, the idea that if, if Ethereum's ever going to go beyond kind of the early adopters, those who are willing to accept the volatility of cryptocurrency, you're going to need to incorporate a payment method or a way to represent value that corresponds with the currency that everyone is familiar with. And we think our model is the best way to do it. It makes sense to most users. You know, I give them my regular dollars and they give me these digital dollars, you know, these, these digital poker chips that can be used anywhere on the Ethereum network. Um, additionally, we've talked with, you know, quite a few VCs or other uh, dApp creators. And again, the reception has been, has been great that they see kind of the promise of the product um, or they see a big use case, you know, with getting, getting our assets integrated with their system. We talked about the prediction market use case before, and I think people are very familiar with that. And it makes it kind of obvious that, yes, if this takes off, stable coins are, are absolutely required. But you mentioned some other interesting use cases uh, on your website. One of them was a fiat denominated crowd sales. H how would that work? Yeah, so you could either do two approaches. One would be the individual has to use our assets to buy into the crowd sale, uh, in which case during the duration of the crowd sale, you're, you're protected from any exchange rate volatility. Uh, because instead of accepting Ether or Bitcoin uh, for, for crowd sale purchases, you're actually accepting the fiat asset that the crowd sales are usually denominated in. Um, you know, most of the recent crowd sales, Singularity and First Blood come to mind. Their, their crowd sale goals weren't a specific number of Ether or a specific number of Bitcoin. It was a specific number of dollars. Uh, and if that's your end goal to raise that amount of, of dollars, you know, why not just start with the currency that, that you want to hold in the end? Um, it, that does come with some concerns of potentially you're cutting off, you know, some individuals from the market who may want to invest in Ether. So the other possibility is just that you have a smart contract that immediately converts that Ether into the DC assets. Uh, so that could be done kind of in real time, such that as soon as you take a donation in Ether, it's converted into the, the, the DC assets to kind of protect the fundraiser from cryptocurrency volatility through the duration of the crowd sale event. Um, it also applies, you know, for these situations where the company's not accessing the funds for a period of time. Um, one good example is actually the Ethereum Foundation, where they raised their uh, their uh, offering in, in Bitcoin or largely in Bitcoin. Uh, and then the price moved against them early on and actually was a, a large reduction in the amount of funds available for development. Um, and that's an example where, you know, had they been denominated in a, a fiat currency, you know, they wouldn't have been subject to that exchange rate volatility. Um, and we think that, you know, certainly it's kind of been the norm so far in the crypto community uh, to, to just accept that as a cost of doing business. Uh, but this, if this stuff is really to take off and, and go mainstream, um, you know, it's really hard to manage a business if your revenue or your cash balance, you know, is in a, is in a very volatile currency. Um, and, in, and in that case, we think that, you know, giving people the ability to match their revenue, their capital, with their expenses and their, their operating expenses, um, you know, that's going to be a huge benefit to seeing businesses kind of adapt this, this type of network. So talking about crowd sale, Alex, um, before we talked a bit about, uh, application, you know, you having a list of use cases that you don't support now crowd sales are, you know, are they legal? Are they legal? Probably depends, but often they probably are illegal. So is that something you would also look at or would you look at each, a crowd sale on their own and say, okay, that's something where one can use decentralized capital for, and that's something where you can't use it for? How, how would you treat that? Yeah, so that's actually something that we are 
currently discussing with with council or actually it's it's kind of on the agenda if you will for the next for the next call um, because it's something we don't know that the, the perfect answer to right now um, because you know we definitely think that a lot of these ICOs are illegal security offerings and in that case there it could be you know putting us at risk if we are the capital that's being used in this case to invest in these companies um, but you know one could potentially argue that well you know they're just acting as a payment processor um, and, and then it's up to the ICO to be responsible for complying, you know, with the regulation that applies to the crowd sale that they're offering. Um, so we actually aren't sure on, on what the answer will be. Uh, but certainly, you know, if it's a legal crowd sale offering, that's kind of, you know, consulting with you know, there's this firm MME out of Switzerland that's been doing a lot of the structuring of the crowd sale approach to make sure that the tokens that are issued have some sort of participation element uh, that ensures they don't get classified as a security. Uh, in that case, we'd absolutely be interested in working with those companies and, uh, you know, being a, a another way of, of raising capital for them. Okay. Uh, another use case you mentioned there was um, on-chain cash management and sort of using it as an accounting system on Ethereum. Can you ex expand a little bit on what that exactly is? Sure. Yeah. So the idea here is that, um, you know, our assets could be the representation of your cash account balance for your business. Um, so a lot of these, you know, kind of promised applications for Ethereum are all about improving operational efficiency, uh, reducing costs when there's kind of a, a, a strict agreement in place between two parties. Uh, so you could imagine some system where in the future, a company that has built themselves as a, an Ethereum blockchain based company, uh, could actually be holding their cash balances on the Ethereum blockchain using our assets. Uh, they could be accepting payments from customers in our assets, be paying suppliers, employees, uh, other operational costs using our assets, all through an accounting system that's using Ethereum smart contracts to kind of manage those that flow of funds. Um, so that could be something that makes kind of an operational efficiency improvement on existing accounting systems, in which case our assets are not just a representation in a, in a ledger, in a balance sheet, but they're actually the assets, the, 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 the actual uh, kind of value themselves uh, that's kind of moving around between these different parties. Um, and that can obviously reduce costs because you don't have to then settle up on the banking side, uh, kind of, you know, making sure that these transactions have gone through because when they're moved within the accounting system, the value itself is actually moved with it. Yeah, so that's kind of talking about the quite a little bit further future where you have entire organizations on a blockchain or on Ethereum that all the funds are on Ethereum, the, the kind of governance structure as well with people signing off on payments and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly right. And we're we're not sure if it will get there, right? You know, that's uh, obviously the project is still in its infancy. Um, and, uh, you know, but there's there's tons of development going. And that's certainly the kind of the grand vision for a lot of people in the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, we think that in that case, uh, it absolutely makes sense as a, as a great use case to actually represent the value within one of these accounting systems. Um, so we actually talked with some of the guys at Consensus that are working on Balance, the, the triple ent entry accounting system. Uh, and they were interested in, in using our assets for some of their prototype stuff um, and, and representing it as as the cash balance that actually is moves around and is used for payment of, of other assets within the system. So taking a step back and, and, and looking at, say, the broader ecosystem, um, perhaps in a sort of medium or longer term, where we have uh, various blockchains, you know, Ethereum and perhaps some permission blockchain networks, uh, whether those be sort of closed or very closed networks or uh, consortium type networks, uh, there could be tremendous uh, potential for a, a fiat denominated cryptocurrency in, in, in such an ecosystem. Um, and, you know, potentially, you know, we may see other uh, stable cryptocurrencies emerge uh, that could potentially be uh, um, competition to, to, the, to the, the one, the, the assets that you're proposing. Uh, can you talk about how, you know, how you see that ecosystem playing out? You know, one, one question that comes to mind is, uh, could, could we have fungibility between, say, uh, decentralized capital assets and assets issued by another company that has a similar model to yours? And also, uh, how would these assets interact with, say, permission blockchains, for instance? Yeah, sure. So that's definitely something that we think about, you know, kind of like you said, the long term vision for all these different chains with different functionality or uh, kind of different actors that are that are operating on them. 
Um, so to the inter, uh, kind of interoperability with, with private chains, that's absolutely something that you know, we kind of have on our radar. Uh, the idea, we actually talked with uh, Dominic Williams of, of, of Definity, or of String Labs, who's working on Definity, and they mentioned they're working on kind of essentially private chain systems that would allow large corporations to bring some of their operations into this blockchain environment. Um, but they have a lot of requirements, um, the, the biggest one being kind of privacy, um, you know, the need to close this system off to outside actors for a lot of various reasons. Um, but there could be a reason then that they want to transfer value from one entity to another, from one private chain to another. Uh, and that could be a situation where our assets would be a good use case of transferring that value from one private chain to another via the public Ethereum blockchain. Um, but we see that as kind of a, a longer um, or just further off in the future in terms of the market that we're tackling. Uh, you know, today we're really focused on solving that use case for Ethereum applications. So you need a payment processor, you need a representation of fiat currency in a lot of these dApps that are coming online. And that's really our focus and what we're, we're trying to serve. Um, we think there's a lot of synergies there that I mentioned earlier, right? So as all these things come on and they're all interoperable, there's more valuable value to the entire ecosystem. Um, and we think that actually could get companies in the future to, to actually want to operate or interact with the public chain as they see kind of this value coming from, from the ecosystem. Uh, to the fungibility piece, that's going to be fascinating to me as, as, as an economist. I think uh, you know, some of these other products may have you know, restrictions on where they can be used or they may be focused on different use cases, serving a different customer set. Uh, we fully expect that all these assets will eventually be traded on exchanges uh, and that you'll actually have a market where you can see what kind of the, the crowd or what investors think uh, is the value of, of each of these assets. Um, you know, we think they'll, they'll trade close to parity, uh, but it's definitely something that we're, that we're interested in seeing. Um, and we've actually heard from, I don't remember who I was speaking to, but they, they said that in, in the past, they've actually seen some of these stable assets actually trade above par, above $1 in, in this case, because of the value that it provides to the ecosystem, where people are essentially willing to take a little bit of a hit, you know, coming from a cryptocurrency into these stable assets, because it is a stable choice or a stable representation uh, relative to the cryptocurrency they were coming from. Um, so that's certainly something that we're excited at looking at in terms of all the data that's going to be created, uh, you know, from this more transparent kind of pricing approach. Now, you were at DEF CON recently, you made a, a demo there. One of the news that came out of DEF CON was that, and this is something that really puzzled me because I was like, really? Uh, was that Santander is doing something with also putting fiat currency on the Ethereum blockchain can you share uh, uh, what the news was there, what they are doing, and how that compares with decentralized capital? Sure. So, yeah, like you, we were kind of surprised that a bank was taking this step this early on to, to interact with the public blockchain. Uh, we actually had a chance to sit down with, with John Whelan, the head of innovation at Santander, who's spearheading that project, and, and talk with him in more detail about kind of what their, their goals are. And uh, really coming out of that um, was just a confirmation that there's there's absolutely room for both of us to, to exist in, and, and thrive. Uh, they're focused on entirely different use cases, mainly that of their existing corporate clients. Um, so what they gave in their demonstration was the use of micropayments. Um, so they showed an example where you know, one of their media clients would, instead of using advertising or have a subscription-based paywall, uh, they'd have a, you know, donate here type thing where, you know, if you read the article and you like it, you can give the guy five cents or, or whatever. Um, kind of a different approach uh, to monetizing content for some of their existing, you know, media uh, corporate, com uh, corporate customers. Um, with that, they expect there's probably going to be kind of restrictions in terms of uh, deposit limits, you know, the amount that any one address can hold, um, because it's really focused on supporting that microtransaction use case. Uh, so in that case, you know, we think there's still plenty of room for us to be successful, focusing on exclusively on the Ethereum applications uh, and the products that are you know, being built on the network that need to represent potentially large stores of value of fiat currency. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it seems like what you guys are doing makes a lot more sense to me than that idea. Because, I mean, micropayments has been enough of a challenge with Bitcoin. Uh, and then with Ethereum, I mean, the adoption and usage for payments is, is zero at this point. Uh, so that seems like a, a somewhat strange use case to pursue to me. 
Yeah, I, I think it just it goes back to who are your who are your customers? You know, who's paying the bills? Um, and as an existing bank, you know, a lot of their revenue comes from their big corporate clients. So they're looking at solving the needs of, of those customers and how can they use this technology to serve them? Uh, we are really focused on serving the needs of, of dApps in the Ethereum community, which kind of manifests itself in those two different go to market strategies. Okay, so we've we've learned quite a lot about your your system, but so what's what's the business model here? How are you guys gonna gonna make money? So we monetize both on the in and out. Uh, so when a customer purchases our assets via wire transfer, um, or when they redeem our assets for kind of the underlying cash deposit, we charge a 0.2% transaction fee. Uh, if customers are coming in via Bitcoin, we actually do not charge any additional fees on top of what's charged by uh, kind of the, you could call them the payment processor, Coinapult. Uh, so just to touch on them very briefly, Coinapult helps protect us from exchange, vol exchange rate volatility in Bitcoin prices. Um, so if a customer wants to purchase via Bitcoin, they get a quote from Coinapult that basically says, send this amount of Bitcoin within the next 10 minutes. Uh, and as long as we receive it within that time period, you're guaranteed this exchange rate for your Bitcoin. Uh, so that allows us to protect ourselves from any price volatility, any slippage there. Uh, we know that what we get from the customer will be turned into an exact amount of fiat currency in our bank account. Uh, and Coinapult charges a 0.7% transaction fee for that. Uh, so the majority of our revenue is going to come from the, the on-chain transaction fees. So sending assets anywhere, peer-to-peer, -to, -peer, to applications, all of that is free. Uh, we don't want to discourage our assets being sent around to, to either other potential customers or being sent to applications for use. Uh, where we charge is on the withdrawal side. So if you've been using our assets to engage in a prediction market on Augur or Gnosis, and then you're the lucky winner of the prediction, uh, you will need to then withdraw your assets, the DC assets, back to your wallet. And that's when we charge a transaction fee. It's a 0.3% transaction fee to get them out of the application. Um, similarly, if you have a business that operates on the network and you want your customers to pay in dollars and euros, when you withdraw those assets back to your account, that's when you get hit with the transaction fee. Uh, the idea there being that you know there are alternative currencies to use in those applications, but they come with price volatility. And if you want to you know, benefit from the price stability that we offer, that's really where we're providing value to the ecosystem. And hence, that's where we take a, a very small transaction fee. Okay, no, that makes sense. That's a, that's a nice, simple uh, business model. Now, I also read in one of your posts where you wrote a little bit about uh, funding, you know, the approach to funding. Uh, I know you, you said some things, uh, some skeptical things about crowd sales. Uh, it's understandable with the focus you guys are having in being regulatory, uh, you know, compliant. So, so what's your approach there? I take it you, you aren't pursuing this sort of uh, traditional crowd sale approach that's uh, very popular at the moment. Uh, how do you see this going forward? Yeah, so I should just add, we, we love the enthusiasm. We love the fact that people in, you know, in, people who hold Ether or Bitcoin want to see other opportunities to fund and help make the ecosystem grow. I think that's going to be one of the keys to making this thing a success, uh, that people are kind of willing to reinvest profits from previous successful ventures and help this whole thing grow and really uh, build on the network effect component that can be so valuable here. Um, having said that, we are a little concerned, especially because of how much regulatory stuff applies to our business, uh, about the legality of some of these approaches. So we are in the, uh, in the future looking to hold a traditional equity crowd sale. Um, so that would be held through um, you know, one of the crowdfunding, the equity crowdfunding portals that exists, uh, likely something through the UK, given our incorporation there. And it would give an opportunity for both VCs as well as people in the community to invest in our business and actually gain equity in the company. Um, so I wrote a blog post on this, but really we think that equity is not only kind of better for the business, um, because if you do the security sale properly, uh, you don't have any risk of, of regulatory issues, but it's also better for the investor um, because you then gain in uh, kind of have an opportunity to participate and benefit from the success of the company, regardless of what form that comes in. Um, so if they change their revenue model or if they add a new product or service that ends up being the one that's successful, maybe they have to pivot uh, or potentially they exit via acquisition. Um, those are situations where an ICO investor might not benefit and uh, you know, might be kind of uh, you know, left with tokens that are, that are no longer valuable. And that's where we think that traditional equity is, is better for both the business and, and for the investor. Um, 
we also see the ICO model adapting to that in the future, and we, we fully expect that the regulation piece will be kind of hammered out such that these ICOs can, can be performed in a compliant way and actually represent uh, a claim on the, the, the business itself such that the investors benefit from, from success regardless of what form that comes in. Um, so then to just to pivot from there, so we are taking, uh, we, we do want to have a way for, for customers to kind of, um, you know, have an opportunity to participate with our product. So we're offering a, a membership sale. So we're calling it the DVIP token. Um, and it allows, it's a $300 token that customers can purchase. Um, and it gives them free transactions, free withdrawals for the next three years. Uh, so through the end of 2019. Um, that that applies to any transaction that's being done on the network. So any of these withdrawals from these applications, uh, we would traditionally charge a transaction fee. Uh, if you are possessing a DVIP token, that transaction fee will be waived. Um, and there's a couple reasons that we wanted to, to take this approach. Um, one, having built our system, you know, this membership sale is, is entirely legal. It's a way to essentially package our product and, and sell it differently. Um, rather than the a la carte purchase method of individual transactions and the fee associated with it, you can pay an upfront fee that will give you unlimited use of the DC assets for a period of time. Um, it helps us bring forward revenue, so we can then take some of that revenue and start building out the rest of the business. Uh, one of the key pieces there being liquidity. Um, so one of the problems that businesses like ours have is there's a big network effect component where the more people who use it and, and the more ubiquitous it is, the more valuable it is to the individuals who want to participate. Uh, but it's really hard to start that, that network. No one wants to be the first guy to the party. Um, the first one to try to use these assets when there, there isn't uh, much available in terms of kind of use cases. Um, so using that, those funds, we plan to do some market making on existing exchanges where we'll make our assets available for sale, which will help uh, kind of spread them out into the ecosystem uh, so that they're, they're more widely uh, available and then can be used on these different applications. Um, and then third is it kind of gives customers, you know, now that they've, if they are a member of, of DC, uh, they then have a vested interest in using our assets and helping the network grow. Um, so then we have kind of uh, a, a market of, of customers, um, you know, who've kind of you know, committed, if you will, uh, to, to kind of use our assets and help us, help us grow the network. Um, so that combined with the, the funding for liquidity, we think will really help us kind of jumpstart the capacity as well as the, the functionality of the DC assets. Yeah, perfect. And the point you made was, I think, a very good one. Uh, and that's a risk people aren't fully appreciating when they're participating in these ICOs today, right? That you, you're buying an asset and it's, you know, it's underlying a certain model of making money. And of course, if you look at startups, how often change those models and approaches and down the line, you know, it goes in different directions. And, and then these can really, I, I mean, either the business is sort of uh, lacks flexibility because they have to stick with this initial token model or they pivot away and then one is uh, sort of left with nothing. I think that's a very, a very dangerous thing, especially when you have, um, I think also business where you have both, right? You have a, an incorporated company with equity that where the tokens may be part of the business model and then they almost have an incentive as well potentially to cut out the, the token holders. So I think that was a, a very important point you made. And I, I think that's probably a topic that we might unfortunately have to revisit uh, more uh, down the line, uh, especially as these, pro these projects mature. Now, you also mentioned to us a new project that you guys are launching and that I think is still uh, sort of in its very early stages uh, called IDEX, a decentralized exchange. W what is IDEX and how does it relate to... to uh, the, the decentralized assets that you guys are issuing. Sure. So as I kind of mentioned early on in the interview, the the idea for DC came out of a situation when my brother was working on a decentralized exchange. Um, we expected that by this point, uh, you know, these exchanges would be uh, kind of more fully fleshed out and, and there would be more, more offerings. Um, but, you know, we think that it's a great complementary product to the DC assets. Uh, you know, having talked about earlier, you know, how do people get these assets if they don't want to do a wire transfer? Well, a decentralized exchange or an exchange operating on Ethereum is a great place to do so. Um, and really, we think that, you know, as the number of assets on Ethereum grow, as these other ICOs um, are, are held, 
uh, you know, as our assets start to get more liquidity, uh, really having a place to exchange them is going to be is going to be critical. Um, so we're focused on using the power of the Ethereum network, the the smart contract system, to create an exchange that's more secure than existing exchanges, uh, that allows people to you know swap assets with one another um, without having kind of the the risk that exists uh, with existing centralized exchanges. So really trying to beef up the security side of exchanges um, while maintaining kind of the speed and um, you know kind of the functionality and attributes that people are, are, are familiar with today. Um, kind of the timeline on that, so we're, we're done with the smart contract development. Uh, we've got most of the, the front end complete and we're really now in the process of kind of integrating and hooking up those two separate pieces. Um, so we hope to be live within probably the next month, month and a half. And it's worth mentioning that, so uh, you know this is obviously a project that's, that's still in the works, but our, our intention, uh, you know, should this product make it to market, which we, we fully expect it will, is that DVIP will also be eligible for free trades on our, our exchange. Um, and really that goes back to the thing I mentioned earlier, where it's a, a way to jumpstart liquidity in the assets. It's also a way to jumpstart a user base. Um, so if we have a bunch of people that can now jump on our exchange uh, and get a more affordable way of, of trading these assets, we think it'll really do wonders to kind of jumpstart the network and the depth of the order books. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming on and sharing all of this about decentralized capital. Now, if people are curious, they want to learn more, they want to get involved, where should people go? Yeah, so come to our website, www.decentralizedcapital.com. Uh, you can join our Slack. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of the website. Um, tweeted us, tweeted us on Twitter, uh, or of course we're we're often in the subreddits. Um, you decentralized capital, or myself, Alex Warren, and my brother Phil Warren. Uh, so if you if you hang around the Ethereum subreddits at all, you'll probably see us comment every once in a while. So you know, feel free to interact with us in any of those social platforms. And with that, we're at the end of our episode. So Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and many others at letstalkbitcoin.com. And well, that's it from us for this week. And we look forward to being back next week.